Hi and welcome back to a new video. We will talk about this HP Omen 16 in today's video. It's also a cooperation with AMD, which also means that at the end of the video, somebody of you can win this Omen 16. Feel free to participate in the giveaway by just adding your details in the Google Forms, which you can find in the link in the description. In this situation, I also want to point out that lately, unfortunately, there have been a lot of like scam attempts on YouTube where there are some bots popping up in the comments and they try to guide you to some obscure telegram or whatsapp groups where then you have to enter your details and then you have to pay to receive a prize. That's obvious scam so please don't fall for that. If we perform any kind of giveaways we will contact you over email and the email will always end with at thebauer.de. So that's how you can see if it's legit or not. Otherwise if you're not sure always try to email me. So at this point maybe already Join the giveaway and then we continue with the video. The HP Omen 16 in the configuration which you can see on my table is right now listed in Germany for 1350 euro which I think is quite attractive for the hardware configuration price performance wise. We have a 5800H AMD 8 core CPU 700 meter in there and also an RDNA 2 RX 6600M GPU. And due to the fact that both CPU and GPU come from AMD means that you can also have AMD advantage features such as smart access memory and smart shift. I'm pretty sure most of you will be familiar with the smart access memory, the fact that the CPU can access the memory of the GPU. We have 8 GB of GPU memory in here and 16 GB for the CPU DDR4. And using smart access memory will give you some benefit. I did a quick test in Shadow of the Tomb Raider. The stock configuration with smart access memory enabled, you have 110 FPS on average and 91 in the 1% low. And now if you enter the BIOS, which is a bit more difficult than what I'm used to, because typically if you enter the BIOS of a device, you press delete or F2, which is not the case on the HP Omen, but I can show you that also in a second because you end up in some kind of diagnostics mode. But if you enter the BIOS using F12, then you could theoretically disable smart access memory, but then you will also have a certain performance loss. As you can see, it would be 104 and 89 FPS. So it's about 5% benefit using smart access memory. With AMD Smart Shift, you would have the benefit that you would look at the entire cooling solution as one piece. Because if you look back like five, six, seven, eight years, you would have your CPU and your CPU cooling solution, your GPU and a GPU cooling solution. And with Smart Shift, you have your entire cooling solution and one like power delivery for everything, like one power budget. And for some certain applications, like some games, the load on the GPU would be higher, especially running higher resolution. And then it makes sense that you put more wattage and more cooling capacity on the GPU because it will just give you more performance and less on the CPU. This configuration is using a 1440p display with 165 hertz and 300 candela per square meters. And that's also, even though that's the best configuration you can get, there's also another configuration like 1080p and I think 250 candela per square meter. I would definitely not get that version, definitely not. This one is okay if you're playing inside, if this is like a desktop replacement or something you can like carry around but you're still in a room which is a little bit more dark like in here, then it's totally fine. You can absolutely enjoy playing your games. But for example, if I go over to my living room where there's a lot of sun coming in from the outside, then on those sunny days, the display is not bright enough. The keyboard is using a simple rubber dome, so no mechanical keyboard. It's using a four zone RGB. And what I don't really like about the keyboard is the fact that the enter key is a bit too tiny. Sounds maybe stupid, but every other device I'm using and they are like 14 and 15 inch use a full size enter key. And on this one, even though it's 16 inch, so you have more space, only has this tiny enter key, which to me, just subjectively speaking, sometimes it's a little bit more difficult to type fast. And because we were just talking about configuring the keyboard, a quick look into Omen Gaming Hub, which is the included software by HP. We will also talk more about the included software in a second. First of all, if you click on Omen 16 on the left, I know it's the German layout, but anyway, you will get it. Beleuchtung probably means something like, I don't know, light configurations or something. But this is the area where you can configure the four zone RGB of your notebook. Apart from your RGB, you can also configure performance. 
So right on top performance. And here you can select between the balanced and the performance profile. Everything I did in today's video was tested with the performance profile. If you use balanced, the GPU power will be slightly lower by like five, six, seven, eight percent. And what I really appreciate is the fact that you can select your own fan curve. So if you change from auto to manual, you can set, but you have to pay attention that you select this like dynamic fan curve, then you can configure your own fan curve. Very simple, straightforward. I'm personally very sensitive when it comes to pre-installed software because most of the time they take up performance, they are very annoying, most of the time not really helpful. On this device, luckily, they didn't have many pre-installed software and like the HP Omen Gaming Hub only had a very slight load in the background. I tracked it during gaming and it was typically between 0.5 and 1.5% load on the CPU during gaming, which is something you will not be able to notice during the gaming operation. If you run Cinebench, however, then it's like 20 or 30 points. So if you're looking for the max Cinebench score, you should maybe disable everything that's running in the background. But you can see in the task manager, those were the services that are pretty much pre-installed that were running in the background. For example, this VPN service, which was also active, but disabling these did not have any kind of positive impact to the performance, which is good. So not a lot of bloatware, that's great. A lot of notebook manufacturers are advertising with big audio names these days. You can find that on almost every premium notebook and that's something, I mean, just subjectively speaking, when I'm reading names like Bang & Olufsen, I'm always, I have very high expectations. I'm not sure why that's the case, probably because those are like famous names, but then yeah, it's always a bit disappointing because at least in this case, the audio quality is good because like the high tone, everything is very clear, very sharp noises. And if you're gaming, it's very clear from which directions the shots are coming from, at least talking about speakers inside the notebook, it's quite clear. Obviously, it will never be able to replace headphones. Like there is no way around getting a decent headset. That's just like no discussion about that. But talking about the bass, like, yeah, the deeper tones, they're just missing. So if you're trying to listen to some good music, for example, it might be a bit disappointing. So in the end, it just sounds like a notebook speaker to me. If I look at the entire package of the device, like everything, like all the components, all the features, for me, this is like 99% desktop replacement and a gaming notebook, like entry gaming notebook. And that's also why I picked the benchmarks. We're just looking at gaming benchmarks because as a creator, I would not choose a device like this, I would have different priorities. And that's why I'm just going to do gaming benchmarks. You can use it for like Adobe Premiere if you want to, but that's something you would do maybe once in a while, but not daily. Now let's take a look at the Omen 16 from the outside, just like the build quality and all kind of features you can expect from it. And when I first unboxed it, when I took it out of the original package, then you're just looking at this. And at first I wasn't even sure what I'm looking at. I think, or I'm like 99% sure that in the end, this is just a sticker, but it's a very well-made sticker. You can almost confuse it for a display for a second. To be fully honest, I'm not sure what the case is made of. It feels like aluminum or some like metal alloy, but I'm not sure, but it feels high quality. If this is plastic, it is extremely well-made because it's a bit difficult to tell what it is. It feels like an aluminum case though. Meanwhile, I had some contact with AND because I was not sure what the case is made of and they confirmed it's fully made out of aluminum, sandblasted and this also explains why it feels so like high quality and also why the case is so stable. The connectors you can find on the right side are 2 times USB type A 3.2 and underneath here. That is a feature I absolutely appreciate because some notebooks are lacking these. It's just a tiny piece of rubber, but in the end, this tiny piece of rubber prevents the display from like knocking onto your keyboard because other devices and also so many other notebooks I've seen over the years usually have the problem that if you close them and if you put some pressure on the center or like on the side, then you will eventually see like marks from your keyboard in the display. And these tiny rubber things on the side should typically prevent that. By the way, it's also a non-glare display if I forgot to mention it earlier. 
All the other connectors are placed on the left side, starting with a full-size SD card slot, audio connection, we have USB Type-C, which is also DisplayPort 1.4 at the same time, HDMI 2.1, DisplayPort 1.4, USB Type-A next to it, and network connection, full-size, which is nice, and then on the total left, the connection for our PSU. I had some comments in one of the previous notebook reviews we did where people were asking for to get better insight on stability of the case and like display. The display is a bit of a difficult thing for me to, to test, like objectively test. One thing you can always look at is how stable is the display when it comes to this. I would say this is like mid stable. It's not like very stable, but also not completely loose. So it's like a mid thing. For me, the main criteria for this would be that if you're typing on a notebook, if you're playing on a notebook, the display should not move. And that's the case. If you're doing this, it looks a bit unstable, but during operation, during gaming or typing, it does not move. Otherwise, you can always do this, which typically feels a bit wrong doing it. But at the same time, it should not be as fragile, like if you do this and your display instantly breaks, then it would be bad. But you can do this all day long and it doesn't, doesn't hurt the device, so that's great. And one more thing you can look at is the stability of the case, which also sometimes can hurt a little bit if you're trying it. Some devices are not that great, but this case luckily is quite stable. So if you hold it like right on the edge, like maybe the first three centimeters, then you can see it's not bending heavily. Like it's a very, very stable case, which I personally would have like as a main criteria when I'm looking at the case stability, because typically your display would be closed and then you carry it around maybe in your backpack. And in that condition, if it's closed, it's like very stable and it should not break or be damaged at all. We will now open up the Omen 16 from the back. And if you now think that I didn't even have any kind of effort to clean the case from fingerprints for beauty shots, that is true. I didn't do that on purpose. I cleaned the front side before taking beauty shots, but on the back side, I just wanted to show you how it looks like after a few days of usage. And you can clearly see fingerprints. They're not that easy to remove because it's also one of these mud type cases but that's what you would typically end up with. Opening the case should be pretty much forward though, because we have just normal screws and also no annoying like warranty void covers. So just opening up should be very straightforward. No special tools needed. If you need any kind of special tools, you can always look at ifixit.com. I just opened up the back and this is pretty interesting. So we have two yellow stickers or like not stickers, but they almost look like thermal pads, but they're quite hard. So I'm not sure what it is. The two yellow ones say yellow and the orange one says orange. There's another one which is like teal. So yeah, if you have any idea what this is, then please let me know. If we take a look at the battery, which is built in, it's 70 watt hour, which is okay. It's enough for six to seven hour runtime, but it could be more because there are like similar devices which have about 80 to 90 watt hour. The built-in SSD comes from Samsung. It's one terabyte. I also tested this with Crystal Disk Mark. Performs about 3,500 megabyte per second on read and 3,000 megabyte per second on write. And now if we take our backplate again, we can see a thermal pad that's making contact with the SSD. We can also see a very nice imprint. So thermal contact to the SSD should be good. Not expecting any kind of thermal throttling even with high usage. On the left side, I spotted something I think I've never seen before in a notebook. That, that's a quite interesting thermal solution. If you peel this off, you will notice it's a thin thermal pad and there's like a copper sheet underneath. So if you put a secondary M.2 drive in here, which you could do for additional storage, then it would be cooled by this copper sheet underneath, which is connected to this heat pipe. That is very interesting. I think I've never seen something like this before. Looking at the two memory modules, you will spot that both of them are fully modular, So both can be replaced and upgraded. No soldered memory, which is great. We have two sticks, eight gigabyte each with 3200 megahertz speed. Looking in ADA64, we had a read rate of about 46 gigabyte per second and a write rate of about 
43 gigabyte per second, which is also on the like upper range of notebooks. I've seen a lot worse, like 35 to 40 gigabyte per second. So that's definitely good speed for memory on a notebook. Now going back to the topic from the beginning, AMD SmartShift, which is automatically always paired with the cooling solution. HP is calling this cooling solution Tempest. And we will now dismantle the cooling solution, take it out, check the mounting pressure, mounting contact of the CPU area, also mounting on the GPU area and how the entire thing is built. If we now investigate the cooling solution further, we will see that the focus is definitely on the GPU part. We have an additional heatsink right here with a tiny fin stack on the left. So that's the GPU part. But in the end, as we already saw from the front, there are two major big heat pipes which are connecting both the CPU part and the GPU part, which then goes back to the fact that it's still one cooling solution. And if you have a certain cooling budget and a certain heat budget, then like the AMD SmartShift makes sense in gaming applications to remove some sort of CPU load and put it over to the GPU to have more capacity for performance on the GPU. What I find quite interesting around the CPU, we have those tiny shunt resistors, four of them. I was wondering if it would be possible to have some kind of power mod on this thing. Might be too much for this video today, but I think I will definitely look into that. The thermal paste connection looks great. So the imprint on both CPU and GPU part look pretty much normal. Nothing to complain about. We have this gap filler stuff for everything around it, like the inductors and the memory modules. Everything has this gap filler stuff on top, so it's not a thermal paste and it's also not a thermal pad, it's something in between. That's something also great if you want to reassemble it, like I'm doing it in this case. Yeah, that's what happens if you touch this stuff, but yeah. This is typically also better than having conventional thermal pads if you reassemble it, because the thermal pad, you can only compress it once most of the time and then you lose somewhat of thermal performance. No worries, I performed all the tests before disassembling it, but still this stuff is usually a bit better when you want to reassemble it. If you pay very close attention to the backside, you will notice that there is an additional fin stack, which is not connected to the rest of the cooling solution. But you can see that like closely down there, we have an additional cooling plate which is going like to the back side or the front side, depending on your perspective. But that's a very interesting thing. So like a dual side cooling, that is quite rare on like an entry level gaming notebook. Okay, but how will this cooling solution work out with clocks and also noise level? If the load is moderate and you have some idle load, then the Omen 6 team is usually pretty quiet and very nice to use. If you're gaming and the GPU is under like 100% load, this will change. The temperatures of the GPU typically reach 80 degrees Celsius, while the CPU is also reaching the thermal limit of 95 degrees Celsius. But that's also what you kind of want to do, because otherwise if you have a lot lower temperatures and lower clocks, it would mean that there is still headroom for additional performance. These CPUs are also built to work in this temperature area, that's also why it's kind of expected. The CPU is boosting to almost 4000 MHz all the time and the GPU is constantly boosting to 2350 megahertz. While you can clearly hear the fans under full load, I would also at the same time recommend to game with a headset and then in this condition you cannot really hear the fans anymore, so not really a problem. All of our gaming benchmarks are performed in 1080p and high settings as we always do it. Starting off with CSGO and max settings, we can reach 223 FPS in 1% low and about 350 FPS in average. In this situation I also want to point out that obviously if you're somewhat more professional CSGO player or more experienced you would always have like lower details and lower resolution which will lead to a lot higher performance than what we showed in this test. In Far Cry 6, we can reach about 69 FPS in 1% low and 87 FPS on average. That is a region I would personally consider very enjoyable to play and pretty smooth. At the same time, I want to point out that back then in December, we were reviewing an MSI Delta 15 
which was also using AMD CPU and GPU combination. And back then we already noticed that Far Cry 6 seems to have some kind of issues switching from the iGPU to the dedicated GPU. And this, for whatever reason, seems to still be the case. So even though it's set correctly in the game settings, Far Cry 6 seems to have issues to put the priority on the correct GPU. But as I showed, if you just set it correctly in Windows, this is not a problem. And since this is also the only game where we experienced this kind of behavior, it seems to be like an exclusive issue with Far Cry 6. In PUBG, the Omen 16 reaches 125 FPS in 1% low and average 174 FPS. And the performance of the 6600M is actually enough to also increase the resolution from 1080p, which we just used for this test, to 1440p. Because I personally think this is much more enjoyable, because I also play PUBG personally quite a lot. It will lower the FPS by about 15 to 20%, but the image will be a lot more sharp, which allows to easier recognize nice enemies and also defeat them. And everything seems to be very sharp and smooth. It's very enjoyable to play with the 165 hertz display. You can clearly notice that you have a very high refresh rate in this device. And if you're now thinking that is pretty awesome, so I will take this device on my journey maybe when I'm sitting in a train for example, you have to keep in mind this kind of performance is only achievable if you run on PSU power. So if you change to battery mode, then you will have significantly lower FPS. Now switching to some synthetic benchmarks, starting with Cinebench R20. And because the CPU will strictly stick to the TDP limit of 55 Watt, we will reach a multi-core score of about 4600 points. If we compare it with a Lenovo Legion 5 Pro, which is using the same CPU but seems to have a higher power target, this can reach about 5000 points. Looking at the GPU performance of the RX 6600M, we will use Times by Extreme GT1. And if you look at the chart, you will instantly notice that it can beat a desktop GTX 1080, which used to be a very good high-end GPU a few years ago. But again, if we look at the RTX 60 Mobile, which is built on the Legion 5 Pro, this is a bit faster. Then there is something really interesting, which I noticed while analyzing the score of the Times by Extreme CPU test. And I noticed that the CPU inside my Omen 16 is clearly beating the Legion 5 Pro even though the Legion 5 Pro is quicker in Cinebench R20. So how is that possible? So I decided to run Times by Extreme CPU test in windowed mode, because this also allows to use different tools at the same time, for example, hardware info. And in this state, I noticed that the CPU consumes about 80 Watt during the CPU test, while it's about 55 in Cinebench. And then I wondered, how is that possible? Then I remembered if you open the AMD driver, there is some built-in monitoring and there you can see AMD SmartShift and it's working to about 30% for the CPU, which means that you can get about 30% higher performance due to AMD SmartShift, which is kicking in for some reason in 3D Mark times by Extreme CPU test, which is quite awesome. And that also explains why the Legion 5 Pro is behind in this specific application or test, because it's using an Nvidia GPU and cannot utilize AMD Smart Shift and this way also loses performance in the CPU test. But then I was also wondering why is this not possible in Cinebench R20, which is a bit weird because R20 is pure 2D load. It's like the GPU will not be loaded at all, which also means that there should be plenty of like thermal headroom if the GPU is not utilized but it's still just sticking to the 55 watt. Then I somehow tried to bypass this like limit. I'm not sure how to call it, but I tried to open, for example, Fermic and fix this at like one FPS to simulate some kind of 3D load in the back to maybe simulate that Cinebench could be a 3D application, but this unfortunately also did not help. In addition, we performed some thermal images. That's always quite helpful to see which area is getting warm and to what degree. And if you're looking at these images, you can clearly see that gaming was the focus when they developed the Omen 16. Because in general, the area where you will put on your wrist is really cold, really enjoyable. And also the region around WSAD 
is pretty cold compared to the right side of the device. Like looking at the keys K and L, they are the warmest with about 35 degrees Celsius, but that's also still a region which is okay to use. And because that's the region you typically don't use while gaming, I think that is a pretty good design choice. Overall speaking, the Omen 16 is an extremely attractive package, especially looking at the price here in Germany for 1350 euro. It's a very good combination with the 5800H and the 6600M also. I'm quite happy with the panel selection they have. The only thing I would criticize a little bit is that the display could be brighter. But that's pretty much the only thing I would really complain about. Everything else is very solid from my point of view. And yeah, I had a lot of fun with this device. If you also want to have a lot of fun with it, then you can feel free to participate in the giveaway. Link is in the description. You can also find additional links like where to buy. Okay, thanks for tuning in. See you next time. Bye-bye.